Last week we started by looking at the word of faith. The application of faith. How we should be able to download the mind of God concerning issues we have on day-to-day -day basis. In the faith movement, there have been a big error in a sense that people have created their own agenda, said it, confess it, it didn't happen, they get frustrated for the simple reason that everything must start from God, it must go through God, it must end with God. And so if you don't have the mind of Christ on an issue, you will be really, really frustrating yourself. It's very, very important. We cannot create a spiritual atmosphere for ourselves that suits our own whims and car prices. We can't do that. It is God that works in us and through us. And therefore, any time you make a move in him, he must sanction it. And as a matter of fact, if he is not in agreement with you on how you feel things ought to be, you must wait on him until he changes his mind. And if it doesn't happen, you'll be frustrated. Seriously, you will be. So last week we dealt with uh, Matthew 8, 5 to 6, and we looked at the uh, uh, centurion. And the centurion said, speak the word, not a word, the word. In other words, there is the word for every situation. There is the word. And basically, the word is Jesus' position on the issue. Today, I want to cause another lovely Holy Ghost confusion. And, <laughs> and uh, hopefully, uh, it will bless all of us. Amen. So come with me to Mark 12, 25. All that I believe the Lord is making us establish here is that we cannot just get up and say things because we want to say it and see it come to pass. On Sunday, I'm going to talk to you about Jacob and uh, what made him successful. And you realize that if you don't know the template of success for you in the realms of the spirit, you can cook your own success and you will be very frustrated. I am coming to the place in my continuous study to realize that every believer's life is mapped by God. And the sooner you get into deep worship to see God's mapping for your life and you walk by the template, the better it is. The reason why Paul was not perturbed and always excited is because he understood that template. Remember when he was going to Jerusalem, God had already showed him the template that he's going to suffer these things. And when the prophet Agabus did what he did, with his belt, and by the interpretation, he was told that this is what is going to befall him. Some of the believers told him that don't go. Then this is what he said. He said, I am prepared not only to suffer these things, but even to die because it has been shown me that is my cause. So at the end of the day, I can rejoice in trouble. But you see, in our life, we have been taught that you can speak it and it shall be. So you are speaking things that are not consistent with what God has purpose for you. It is not the word. You are speaking a word. So it doesn't come to pass. It's not because you are unholy. It's not because you live in unforgiveness. It's not because you're not kind. It's not because you don't pay your tithe. It's not because you don't go to church. But it's just that God himself has orchestrated certain things for you and your journey of life might be completely different from mine. And this test is going to bring you some deep truths 
That, in my opinion, some of us, it might shock us. Let's look at the text. Mark 11, 12 to 25. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. Verse 15. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, it, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Verse 18, the chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, they went out of the city. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you have cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. I tell you the truth, if anyone says to this mountain, go and throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Verse 25. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. So, they were leaving Bethany. Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if there was any fruit. When he read there, he found there was nothing on it. Because it was not the season of figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat from you again. Underline, may no one ever eat. Very important. He didn't place in there for nothing when he says that it wasn't fixed season. So there is some sort of unfairness here because it wasn't fixed season. So why the situation? We'll come back to Go straight, uh, break it down. Somebody say, the word of faith. And his disciples heard him say, on reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began to drive out folk because they have turned the house of God into den of thieves. There is a reason why this was intersect, inters, what is it, uh, place in the middle of the narrative. All right? Because there is a distraction in worship. And because there is a distraction in worship, people are not connecting to the source and object of their worship. That was put there for a purpose. Because now more people are interested in the car they drive and the houses they buy and the marriages they go into and so on and so forth. So people are not tuning in. And in fact, today there are so many divorces in the church all because people are not even hearing God anymore. They cannot make decisions based on, because you see, it is the word of faith. In other words, in your marriage, there is a word. In your schooling, there is a word. In your church going, there is a word. People you connect with, there is a word. And if we are able to come to that place, and it's not difficult. It really is not difficult. If worship comes without any um, distraction, we can hear God clearly. We will not hear him say, that say the Lord. But he will definitely download stuff to us. He will give us comfort in our spirit. Now let's leave this argument for now and move on to uh, uh, um, the latter part of it. So he said, my house shall be called the house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. 
So the chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and they began looking for opportunity to kill him and so on and so forth. And obviously they had to now uh, 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 leave the city uh, and, and, and go back. So when evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. In the morning as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Then he says, have faith in God. Let's break it down for a second. He says, Rabbi, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. He turns to him and he says, have faith in God. The translation there, the word pistis in Greek is used. When you break it down, you can say God's faithfulness. But breaking it in a layman's language, some have said you can say have God's kind of faith. I'm not very comfortable with have God's kind of faith because God is finite. So he cannot have faith in anybody. But then your clear understanding of pistis, which is faith, comes into play before you can appreciate this test. And basically, what he's saying is that what God has said, believe in it. So actually, it is God that cares the fig tree. It was his plan that the fig tree be cursed. So it wasn't just the desire of Jesus just to curse him. So in other words, he's telling him that anything God says, you're going to see that he is faithful to see it through. So your entrenchment is in him is based on what he says, not what you make him say. You understand it better as we go along. So, put that at the back of your mind. Jesus answered, so truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt it in their heart. If anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea. In the beginning, it gives you the understanding or the, or the feel that it is you saying to the mountain, Go throw yourself down in the sea. Until he qualifies it by the statement that does not doubt in their heart. Now, you don't doubt yourself. You doubt a third person. So if he says that, go through the mountain, uh, tell the mountain, go through yourself in the sea. And he's telling you that you don't doubt it in your heart. Basically, what he's telling you is that if God says that the mountain should be thrown into the sea, you've got to believe it. And if you believe it and say exactly what God is saying, it's going to be so for you. It's quiet, but we're going to take it further. So he's saying that, and that's not doubt it in your heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Because he uses the word spirit. The Greek word there is pneuma, out of which you get the word pneumatology, the study of the spirit, or the Holy Spirit. So basically, what he is trying to tell you is that uh, you got to have God's kind of faith. Not because God needs somebody's faith, but he's just using the word pistis that can be translated his faithfulness. So now, if God is saying that red can be blue, all you got to be also saying is what uh, red can be blue. Now, if God is not saying that red can be blue, and you're going to say that red can be blue, you are on your own. Hallelujah. Amen. He has said that the dead can come back to life. 
But if he hasn't told you that at this death I'm going to raise back to life, and you go and stand there, I tell you the dead will be rotting in your face straight away because. <laughs> Hallelujah. If you go and stand at the square and then see some cripples start sitting there, and then and then and then I was listening to I was listening to this this prophet. I I've never listened to him, and, and I fell in love with the guy. You know, I know people don't like him, but I like him for what I've heard so far. I like him. He's got a very funny name, Kum Chacha. <laughs> and 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 he's been he's been instructed by some pastors to go to uh, some town where they've lynched some military officer and everything else, and he's been asked to go there do crusade. And he said, "Me, go there." The pastor who called, if he's wise, he should go there. Is he also a pastor? Is he a, 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 a taxi driver? Or <laughs> And the funny thing, the funny thing, and he says I'm so powerful and so deep. He said that I am not saying anything God is not saying. And I'm not going anywhere God hasn't sent me. He said if God says to me that I have sent you to this particular place, then I'm going to get up quickly and go. And then whilst he was talking, somebody called. And said that, Pastor, you need to go to this place. So he asked the person, Are you a believer? The person said, Yes. I said, He asked the person, Do you have brothers and sisters? He said, We are seven. And he said, One of us, even is a pastor. He said, Then tell the pastor among you to go with his instruments and everything and go repair the crusade grounds. When he's ready, I'll come over and preach the word. But I learned a lot from what he was saying that at the end of the day, we think that we can champion. Everything. And we have not even spent time with him. We don't know his will concerning the matter. We don't know his will concerning the purpose. We don't have understanding of anything. And we, can th we think that we can just get up and show our faith muscle by, by saying things God is not saying. And that is why there is that frustration in the church. That is why a lot of times uh, we see things that we say things that don't come to pass. And we feel that God is not hearing us. Yes, God is a good God. And at the end of the day, no Christian is on his own. You cannot do it all. He gives you a mapping for your life, a mapping for things you need to uh, put in place. And above all, he wants his name to be glorified in you. So the first thing you do in your pursuit of God, where the word of faith is concerned, is you must, number one, and I told you last week we're going to talk about this, how to apply the word of faith. Number one, know what God is saying. That's the first thing. Is it a healing situation? In buying a house? In, 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 in pursuing education? Know, number one, what God is saying. As soon as you are 100% clear of what God is saying, number two, you stick to what God is saying. Hallelujah. So number one, you know what God is saying. Two, you stick to what God is saying. That is where it says that my faith is not wavering. That is where it says that in the midst of uncertainties, I still hold on to the word because I know he said it. When everything around you becomes shadows in the light of him, you are still paying to that word that God is going to do it. Moses faced the Red Sea. And he knew God sent him. He was of the surety that the people of Israel are definitely going to end up in the promised land. But here we stand. The Red Sea. The armies. The left wilderness. The right wilderness. There is no, there's no way out. And he says, stand still. And see the salvation. Why? Because he had a sure word. And his word was powerful. Because it came with thunder and fire. With plagues and miracles. 
So he was 100%. I mean, this is a miracle that, as far as I'm concerned, hasn't happened before. This was the first time it was recorded in the Bible that the Jordan one and all those things happened later. So it wasn't like he was looking at something that has happened before and he wants to replicate it. You must hear God to look at a sea and expect the sea to part. (laughs) And the beauty is that it is not his word. But you know, what makes God God in the eyes of men is when you and I yield 100% to him. When you and I, because without us, he cannot be effective on earth. So he said, I need a man. A man who will stand in the gap. I need a man who will be my mouthpiece. I need a man who will speak the word. I need need a man who will declare what needs to be declared. So he always looking for a man. And when Moses saw the situation, he knew that the only solution to this obstacle is for a breakthrough to happen with the Red Sea. And he stretched forth the rod. And immediately it parted into two. Because God is the one who initiated that. The faith movement have gone into big error. And that big error is that we concord things ourselves. And we want things to be for us. And in most cases, it doesn't. That is why people have backslided. Some are in church and they are cold. Some don't want to know about God. Some, because their forefathers worship God and their mothers worship God and they went to Sunday school and everything, they still come to church because they are afraid God will strike them dead. But really, they don't engage. Because at the end of the day, they've prayed and have not seen answers. They have believed God for certain things and it hadn't happened. Sometimes even they ended up being worse because of what reasons you can give to it. But the truth of the matter is this. That the word is what the centurion said. He said, you speak the word. So, in applying that, I said, knowing what he, uh, he is saying, and then sticking to what he's saying. Very, very, very important. Sticking to what he's saying. If you stick to what he's saying, no matter what happens, at the end of the day, he will speak and will not lie. But the third thing that is so beautiful about it is that when you stick to what he is saying, you will not find yourself wanting. You will always, always uh, be vindicated. And you stick to what you say. It results in you being vindicated all the time. Glory to Jesus. There's this guy, when we became young Christians, and, um, I think he read, he read somewhere, I don't know how his faith was developed in that, in that realm, but he was going through this house and head wailing. And the Lord said to his heart, that he should go and pray for the dead. He went in there to pray for the dead. And nothing was happening. Everybody, people everywhere mad with him and stuff like that. And, uh, the, 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 the head of family, I understand, were going to drive him out. So the mother of the child or the mother of the person that died said that we don't lose anything. We don't lose anything. If he prays and it happens fine, he doesn't, we don't lose anything. The boy was at it for about an hour or two. I've forgotten. It's a long time story. But the end of the story is that the person came back to life. He came back to life. His faith was vindicated. Hallelujah. Because Jesus said that, have God's kind of faith. In other words, know that God is faithful. Whatever he has said, he will do. So now you don't go by your word. You go by the word of God. But this is the interesting bit of it. It says that now, when you pray, not doubting in your heart. Remember, God communicates with you in your heart. 
And so when you pray without doubting, what don't you doubt? You don't doubt his word. Not your word. Because you have to doubt somebody or not doubt somebody. So Jesus is actually telling you that when you sit to pray, and, 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 and Sunday we might go deep into this, but let me just mention it now. When he says that if you dwell in him and his word dwells in you, whatsoever you desire, a better translation of that word is this. If you dwell in him, whatever you see in him and you pronounce, it shall be because you get the clarity from him. So, 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 so everything you say will be what he is already saying. Now, God is telling us all this for one reason and one reason only. So we can draw water closer to him. You cannot be out there and do your own thing and blame it on God. After all, if you live in a house, it's your father that sends you. If your father sends you, he equips you. And he gives you everything you need. If you go and something happens to you, it is his responsibility. He covers you. It's the same principles. But people have gone out of him and haven't done anything he has told them to do. That is why he says that. I don't know you. Mr. Policeman comes... And he says that, uh, we, we, told him, we saw him uh, driving this way. He said he was using your driving license or doing that. So oh, I don't know him. But he was doing that in your name. But I don't know him. Hallelujah. The, 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 the reason why we pray in the name is that reason. We don't say in the name of Jesus for saying sake. No, no, let me just explain the, the name. Hallelujah. This is what God is saying. So I take the word and I say what God is saying. So basically, I'm saying that in his name. Just like I demonstrated on Sunday, for those of you at church on Sunday, all right, I want to call Keziah. And I call Chegun to call Keziah. Chegun, Pastor Chegun calls Keziah in whose name? In my name. Not in his name. But he becomes the sole agent because I am not in his space and I'm not in your space. And for that reason, he must do it in my name. So at the end of the day, if he comes and he calls you, and I haven't called you, and he says, I'm calling in your name, well, how do I respond? I just have to tell you, I didn't call you. So a lot of prayers that we conclude by, in the name of Jesus, is a fallacious prayer. I don't know if it's a proper English word. <laughs> it's a fallacy. It's wrong. It's, it's, just, it's just false. Because at the end of the day, and that's why I said that, them that gather, three or two that gather in the water, I am, and it's not every gathering that he is there because the gathering wasn't called by him. So you can be perfectly involved in a man's agenda where God is not involved, but the sentiments and the feelings and everything will feel okay. The Bible says the Israelites came to worship the Lord and they were dancing and worshiping. Everybody had a good time. The keyboardist was good. The bassist was good. Everything was absolutely fantastic, fantabulous. And they were all good. As they were going back, sharing with each other how wonderful service was, how I danced to my heart content, how, how I was feeling, Mr. Bassist, I was feeling, Mr. Uh, uh, Sassophonist, and stuff like that. And the God speak. He said, all oh, spoke. And he said, all oh, that happened there, I was not in it. Oops. So you can have a good meeting. So the, the fact that two or three have gathered in what they think is the name of God doesn't necessarily mean it's the name of God. You can go through the whole emotions. You can fake it. Women know how to do that. Ask married women. Okay, I'm not going to go there. You can fake it. Fake the whole process. And uh, at the end of the day, <laughs> it's just going to be what it should be. So conclusion, and I take some questions. Come back to the test. We understand that we have to know what God is saying. If that is the case, we cannot be excused for not knowing God's purpose. Jesus then puts a bridge there. And he says that the problem then, why Peter can have God's kind of faith or have faith in God 
is the middle bit he puts in there. Because the house of God, which should be a place of worship, where we can hear God, because that's what Paul puts in his elaboration. He said, when we come together, somebody has hymns, somebody has songs, somebody has, but in that gathering of worship, God will always what, uh, speak. He said, in that time when worship goes up, let the prophets do what? Uh, speak. For the Bible says that the church is built on the foundations of the what? Uh, the prophets and the apostles. So every worship setting the mind of God must be released. So when you come to church on Sunday, the mind of God must be released huh, for that week. The mind of God must be released for your job interview. The mind of God must be released for your going out and your coming in. The mind of God must be released on certain things. Even if you're going to get sick, you should know it. Yes, I knew it. So, 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 so God will come through worship. And if it doesn't happen within the realm of the worship itself, then when you have gone into bed, he might reveal it to you through what? A dream. Now, he doesn't give you your whole lifespan or else you'll be lazy and become very uh, 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 abortive where vision is concerned. So he gives you poco a poco. Small, small. Little by little. He doesn't give you the whole light. He gives it to you. So you know that this is his will in this matter. When God forbid somebody is sick. And you know that this is the word. That he's going to come back from the sickness. Then you've got to stick to it. And it will happen. Unfortunately if God says that that is the end of that person also. Then you know. Now you talking. When God says that is the end of that person. And you talking to that person in your faith language. Nothing will happen. If you are not happy about that situation, it isn't the person you talk to. You go back to worship. And you get God to change the word into another the word. And then you apply what he is saying because everything starts from him. Everything goes through him. And everything ends with him. So worship now becomes very, very, very important. But he tells us two things in the text, and I'll take questions. He says that the church has been turned into a place of distraction. So people are distracted. There's too much sales going on. There's too much fluff going on. So worship is no longer even worship. Sometimes it is three songs, three fast ones, and two slow ones. And that is it. People are judging the key should have been F. But how come the key is in G? And stuff like that. And the worship leader, we have to make sure that the voice is operatic. It's very sweet and wonderful and powerful. And stuff like that. I'm not saying this is uh, uh, bad. But I'm just saying that we cannot put emphasis on professionalism and lose touch with the essence of his persona, of reaching out to him. And that is what it becomes. So everything now has become very perfected. We have to finish it in 15 minutes. And we don't care if somebody is in the middle of crying. We have to give him tissue to wipe his tears and sit down. We don't care if somebody is rolling. We have to just get him sit down. We don't care when prophecy is flowing, we have to shut him up. <laughs> shut it. Time to prophesy is gone. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so, the church then had this problem. Today we don't sell turtle doves and pigeons and uh, all those things in the church. But there's equally different levels of uh, distractions that takes place. Then the second point he talks about is that when there is unforgiveness, the Spirit of God cannot pray. There are certain sins that when you have committed, now don't misunderstand me, but there are certain sins that when you have committed, it's possible that if the trumpet should sound, grace will be extended. But as for the sin of unforgiveness, and for me it amazes me, 
how people don't talk to people and they claim to be preaching the word of God. How people feel they have been offended in the church and they move out of our churches and they go to other places preaching. I'm like, it's a big joke. How people walk in unforgiveness. They don't forgive people who have blessed them, who have pastored them. They don't forgive people who have been there for them and, and blessed them. They don't forgive people who give birth to them like their fathers and their mothers, people who have, you understand? And, and yet we claim we worship in God. That is how he concludes the matter here. So there are two obstructions that he puts in place. He puts the one, the corporate one, and then the final one is the personal responsibility. And that's why he says that. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your father in heaven may forgive you. Jesus developed it another way in Matthew. And he says that when you come to bring, engage in worship, and you remember not that you have offended someone, Someone has offense against you. He says, leave your offering. That's what the offering is very important. Don't take it away. He says, leave your offering at the altar. And then go and resolve whatever issue it is. And then come back. Why? Because we have underestimated worship. Worship is no music. Worship has got so many facets to it. But the core worship, that is the time where we are just lying in his presence and connecting spirit to spirit. And yada, as the Hebrew puts it, yada, them that know, yada, they are God. When we get into that space, that is when things become clear. That is when your life is mapped out before you for the next how many days. And so even you walk away and some calamities happen, you are not shaking because you have already encountered that in the worship like Paul it's not everything about Paul that went well but he smiled through it all because it was won before it happened nothing would take the worshiper by surprise because he's entrenched and that is what he was talking about in Matthew 11 our mission is raising overcomers setting the captives free Freedom Center International is here to support you in every step that you take with the Word of God as you seek spiritual and emotional wholeness. And we hope you've been blessed by today's message. Worship with us at 38 Upper Wickham Lane, Welling, Kent, DA16 3HF or give us a call on 0207 You can also visit us online at fcichapel.org And remember, there is progress in freedom.